lift up your voice on behalf of all of us. Uh, sometimes we forget, I was having this discussion with some of my Christians of another faith a few weeks ago. In church when we pray, we don't pray on the behalf of the person who is praying. It's not, I pray, I ask you. It's we pray, it's we ask God on behalf of everybody. When one person sings, like uh, Glad Gladwin just, uh, Gladys just Gladys. sang, sorry, uh, when uh, Gladys just sang, he didn't sing on his behalf. He sang on behalf of all of us. And it is for that reason that we don't have clapping in church. Why? Because it's not a, it's not a performance. It is worship on behalf of all of us. And how well or uh, not well does not matter because it's a heart that we lift up to God on behalf of all of us. But in this case, it was also well done, so thank you. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a, on a little bit of a holiday from uh, deep uh, Bible study. And we're going to go back to the deeper studies. And so... In the meantime, we're going to study a little bit more superficially. And what do we say superficially? It doesn't necessarily mean superficially intentionally, but that there are certain passages of Scripture which are less difficult to explain. And part of those are the parables. Although it is important that we understand what parables are and make sure that we extract from each parable only that which Christ intended to be extracted. I've heard sermons from many, many, well, colleagues, friends, uh, and I have done it myself, where we go into a parable and we extract all kinds of things from each parable. The parables are intended to teach one lesson. Today, we come to the second set of parables that Jesus told. Last week, we studied the first set. Does anybody remember what that was? This is a pop quiz. For those that are students, <clears throat> 93? Uh, do you remember last Sabbath? What was, you know why I call her 93? I have to change her name now. I call her 93 just as I call, uh, where'd she go? Where's Omega? Omega, oh, she's gone to her class. I call her Omega 9. That's, there's a reason for that. I call her 93 because that's the highest grade she got in her uh, project. And that's very good. Now I have to change her name to Perfect. Because this week she got a, it's okay, a Perfect score. So I have to change her name now. So in testing your quiz what was our parable last week? You know, the cloth on the suit? <laughs> the new, you guys, man. <laughs> and uh, look, at she wasn't here and she said those. What a good story. You know, in school, uh, most students hate students like that. Who know the answers even when they're not there. Yeah. So last week we studied the new cloth on the old cloth and new wine into old wineskins, which we don't want to mix. That was the first set of parables. Today we have the second set of parables, and it was right on a minute again. You are the what? Salt. salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the... What? You are the... Light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Some of your translations will say a city. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. 
parables don't sit in a vacuum. They don't appear and stay by themselves. Parables are related to studies just before the parables and just after the parables. And in order for us to understand a Bible verse, a Bible passage, a parable, we need to have the huh, huh, say it again? Context. You guys are good students. That's great. We have to have the context. And the, the, the worst way to study the Bible is to take what we call proof texts. Take a text from here, text from here, text from here, and make a theology out of it. Doesn't work that way. In order for us to understand the parables of Jesus Christ, we've got to understand the context. So let's go back now to the earlier part of Matthew chapter 5. Luke, by the way, records this, and he, the same Sermon on the Mount. And before the presentation of the Sermon on the Mount, Luke tells us that Jesus spent the night in prayer the night before. In fact, Luke always includes whenever there was a great event in the life of Jesus or a great presentation, Luke always notes that prior to that, Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. Matthew doesn't record that, but he did. So now after this prayer, Jesus is there and the crowds are following him as usual. And he introduces what is known as the best all-encompassing sermon ever preached. Ever preached. The first, part, the first part of the sermon, verses 1 through 12, is what we call the Beatitudes. One day down the road, we will have a study on all the Beatitudes, and we will have one full sermon at least on each Beatitude. But today I'm just going to go through it very quickly. So it sets us up to understand the parable. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are who? Poor. Who are poor in spirit? Who are poor in spirit? Sir? Those who are in spiritual poverty. Those who are poor in spirit. Does that mean people that are always in a bad mood? Someone who's negative and always fun to hang around with? Huh? No. Those that are humble and in humility, in recognition of their lack of spiritual status. We spend a great deal of time studying Isaiah, you remember? Isaiah went around all of Jerusalem, and this was the time of King Uzziah. Great things happening and churches were full. And let's say the, the temple was full overridden with people, all appearing to be very righteous. And Isaiah went to them and said, what? Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Woe means curse on you. And there were all people who thought they were righteous. And Isaiah, of all the people there, who was the most righteous? Who lived the life that God wanted them to live? Who else but Isaiah? And Isaiah felt so self-righteous that he went around telling everybody that you're terrible, you're terrible, you're terrible, you're terrible, and you're terrible, even though you go to church every, every week, and maybe even every day. You're terrible. Woe unto you. You're sinners. Your righteousness, your righteousness is no good. It is Isaiah who says that your righteousness is as filthy 
drags. You know, it's uncomfortable sometimes to talk about things in church. But I dare say that if the Bible tells us something, it's okay to talk about it. Amen. In the book of Hebrews, to make the point, not the book of Hebrews, in the Hebrew language, when Isaiah says, your righteousness is, is as filthy rags, it has a very different, a very special meaning. It's not a rag that you go and wipe your hand out as a dirty towel. Many years ago, Kingsway, grade 11, we were fortunate to have a Dr. Valentine be our teacher, only for one year. He finished his PhD, and he didn't get a job right away, so he came to Kingsway. It was my good fortune that I was in his class. Because after that year, he left and went to teach at university. He taught us many, many, many things. And one of the great things he taught us was how to study the Word of God. And to make the point of the value of our righteousness, he told us a Hebrew secret that we never knew. That I'm about to tell you. When the Bible says, when Isaiah says, your righteousness is as filthy rags. The Hebrew word for filthy rags is the menstrual rag that was used by women for the monthly cycle, which is set aside and away from all other things. Unclean and never to be touched, except during that time and by that person. Does that put a new perspective on our righteousness? There is nothing that I can do. When Isaiah was a righteous man before the people, following the word of God, keeping the commandments, when he saw the righteousness of God, and when he saw that even the angels who never sinned didn't feel righteous enough to be in the presence of God, he said what? Woe is me. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm destroyed. I am nothing. It is that spirit of knowing and acknowledging that we are poor in spirit. When I acknowledge and I recognize that I'm useless no matter what I do, I, I cannot do anything. That will make me more righteous than the angels in heaven. And therefore, I will never be as righteous as God. I cannot be as righteous as God. I acknowledge my unrighteousness. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. What does that mean? Blessed are those who mourn. This is not just being sad. The word mourning here in the Greek actually means wailing, crying out loud. When we went to the first few funerals in Canada, I couldn't understand why people didn't cry at funerals. It was all very mannerly and all very quiet. And then somebody told me that, uh, that uh, you know, these uh, people, they take, uh, they're, they're given pills, they take medicines to, to subdue their emotions and that's how they can stay in control. And I believed it for a long time. But if somebody dies back in India, the whole village cries for a month, wailing and gnashing of teeth. That is mourning. And mourning over what? Mourning of the fact that I am sinful. Mourning of the fact that I am undone. Mourning of the fact that I am unrighteous. Mourning of the fact that I am impure. And when I mourn, I will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. The word meek here is only applied to two people in the Bible. And who might that be? I know you know this. One person who is known to be meek, we all know, was our Lord Jesus Christ. You guys all got that one, right? Who was the second person who was known to be meek in the Bible? Moses. Who? Moses. Moses. Moses is the only second person to be meek. Do you know what the word meek means? Meek means a 
it actually comes from the, 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 the word that is used to train wild animals. So, if in India or in, the, in Africa or in Thailand, in those countries, if you have an elephant that is going to follow its nature, its natural path to do whatever elephants do, if you take that great powerful behemoth and you bring him under control and you get him to submit and now he gives up his will and he begins to do the will of those that control him, he has become meek. Jesus became meek in that he came under the control and the desires and the commands of his Father. He says, what I do, not my will, but the will of my Father who is in heaven. Moses, before he was asked to be a leader, he was trained to be the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh. God took him and put him out to pasture in the wilderness to train him, to bring him under control that he may begin to set aside his own will and do the will of the Father. That is meekness. He said, blessed are the meek. I have to ask myself, do I fit into that category? You know, it's very easy to be meek and do the will of the Father as long as the will of the Father agrees with me. And as long as it's comfortable. And as long as it fits into my schedule. But the moment the will of the Father becomes opposite of mine or my appointments or my schedules, Conflict with that of the Father, and I pick whose? My own. And I say, oh no, God, don't forgive me. I'm not meek. I am meek when I have given up my control over to God's. That is why Romans chapter 10 says, the people will suffer. Why? Because they have not submitted. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Because we try to work on our own righteousness, and we can't. We just submit to the righteousness of God and the control of God in our lives. So we do that which He wants us to do. Not by my will, but by His will. Not under my control, but under his control. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst. How many of you hunger and thirst for things? I know I have objectives from time to time. I used to have many more. I have a lot less now. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. By the way, I'm drinking my water. I take this medicine that makes me really thirsty. It dries up my mouth, so you'll pardon me. But, blessed are those. Do you want, do you, I think, I don't eat as regularly as most of you do. And there are times when I get really, really, really hungry. And I either don't feel like looking for food or trying to cook food or order food and I'm too lazy and I say, ah, just forget it. I'm just going to go to bed. But if you wake up in the middle of the night and you haven't had anything to eat, my goodness, your stomach tells you you haven't eaten. Almost hurts, it's almost painful. And you hunger for something, then you go into the fridge and find that there are too many moldy things. <laughs> so then you open up a can or something, and a can of chili or something, and satisfy the hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what? righteousness. If I hunger and thirst, let me ask you, if you are hungry and you are really thirsty and somebody says to you, well, let's go for a five mile walk, <laughs> what is going to be your priority? Huh? You want to satisfy first your thirst. 
than your hunger. Then you want to sleep for a little bit because you've eaten too much. And then when you wake up, you might think about a walk. There are priorities in life. And being hunger and thirst, thirsty chases us to look for food and water. And we spend, if, if well, I'm going to cut my own sentence, if we were not living in this kind of a world, if we were living out the wild like a Maasai in Africa, for example, or any native tribes anywhere in the world, New Guinea, in the hills of India, do you know what they spend all their time? You know what they do all their time? From morning till night, they hunt for food to satisfy their hunger and their thirst. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst like that. For what? For righteousness. For righteousness. I could, I'm going to take my coat off, do you mind? You know the Bible says in Ezekiel that the priest must not allow the sweat to touch his garments. You know that? Oh yeah, it does. And so I got to make sure that I don't. <laughs> but when we thirst and we hunger after something, we spend a lot of time trying to satisfy that. Even when we go to our work and our jobs and our various places, before we go there, we kind of plan out either what we're going to take for lunch or buy lunch or make some sort of arrangement. Am I right? Or we're going to say we're going to have a little bit of money in our pocket so we can buy something. Think about it. We're preoccupied with making sure that our hunger and our thirst is satisfied. Question that I must ask, and I would invite you to ask. What is your time spent seeking, hungering after, thirsting after? How much time do we spend being fed the Word of God and drinking the water that is Jesus Christ? Psalm 42 says that like the deer that panteth after the water, I pant, I thirst, I chase, I go looking for the water that is our God. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. In the process of selling some rental buildings, one uh, family, one couple was talking to me a week ago, last week. And they said, how come you're selling these buildings? I said, I'm trying to sell certain types of buildings. And the low-income buildings are very difficult. You have to be very tough with your tenants. And I said, when I started in this business, I had no trouble being tough with the tenants. <laughs> But over the last couple of years, I find it very hard, very hard. Somehow, don't have the heart to be as tough as I need to be in order to be able to manage what I need to manage. It's not because I'm a nice guy, it's not it. That's not it. I still want to get paid the rent. But in the old days, if there was a problem with the tenants, we'd get them out one way or another. We'd resolve the problems. But now when you mix mercy into that formula, it changes your life. It changes your life. And it's not something that I planned on doing. I didn't want to be a merciful landlord, my goodness, I couldn't be a landlord. Didn't plan it. And I still don't think I am. 
But I do know this. That God expects, when he looks at me, he expects me to be merciful. Amen. Because I can only accept his mercy to the extent that I can give it. Mercy, like forgiveness, is a two-way street. Forgiveness, for it to be effective, you must forgive me, and for it to be complete, I must be able to accept it. And if I cannot give mercy to full measure, I cannot have the faith, I cannot have the understanding, I cannot believe the reality that God can be so merciful to me, a sinner, and therefore I fail in accepting the mercy of God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart. The Apostle Paul says, those things that I want to do, I cannot do. Those things I don't want to do, I cannot do. That means in his heart the law is written. He wants to do this, be pure in his heart. But what comes out all the time is not pure. God makes a stone heart into a heart of flesh. He writes his law into our heart. He purifies us from inside. That we may be transformed because we have been saved. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called what? The children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Why the children of God? God is the ultimate peacemaker. And where is God's primary focus in making peace. God's primary focus is in making peace with humanity. Atonement, the restoration, the redemption of the human race, where the human race chose the path of Lucifer and went away from God. God makes provision and calls the human race back to himself through Jesus Christ and becomes the greatest peacemaker. Now you know, earlier today, Lalita brought this little baby, and she says, look at the eyes, look at the eyes, look at the eyes. These eyes are like my grandfather's. These eyes are well known and recognized in the family from our grandfather's. We take on the genes from our father. When we grow up, maybe the way you walk, Jubin, maybe the way you talk, maybe the way you run, sooner or later people are going to say, say to you, hey, that, you do that just like your dad. Just like your dad. Why? You are the son of your father, so what you do and how you do it will reflect what your father did and who he was. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Why the children of God? Because he is the ultimate peacemaker. Therefore, we have no choice, but it comes through us by the children of God to be lovers of peace and makers of peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When there comes a time for us to make a decision, whether we're going to do this or this, we have to take a stand. I had a fellow with me in a car, in my car, a couple of months ago. And that little uh, Mazda, it drinks up oil as if it had a straw. That's the way they're made. Because it uses the oil for more than just uh, lubricating the engine. It also uses for other things. And so you have to check the oil quite regularly. So I was at a gas station and uh, this fellow got out and says, let me pump the gas. And sure he did. I was on the phone. He uh, pumped the gas and uh, he pumped the hood 
and uh, it was a self-serve station. He bought uh, some oil, put some oil in, and uh, got in the car, drove off, uh, did pay. Drove off, and as he went around the block, he says, you know, I threw a couple of bottles of oil in the back for you. I said, what do you mean? I just threw a couple of bottles. I said, what's it, to be paper? No, 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 he didn't notice. I said, dude, you just started working for me. You're stealing oil from the gas station. I turned back around and went back and put the oil back. You know, he thought that there was something wrong with me. He was annoyed with me that I made him go back and put the oil back. It's a simple example. Very simple example. But when we accept the standards of the world without question, we have given up standing up for God. If we give up in the little things, we will most certainly give up in the bigger things. Most certainly. And we will be ridiculed. And it wasn't too long before I had to cut my relationship with this young man. Because his attitude showed up in other areas. But we as people that represent God have a standard for which we are responsible. And that standard and that conscious, that conscience comes to us from our God and through His Spirit. Amen. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The way I read that, if somebody insults me, and uh, persecutes me and makes false, uh, false accusations against me because of God, it's okay. I gotta walk away. But if they do it just because they're being mean and got nothing to do with God, then I gotta fight with them. Am I right? Then you gotta stand up and fight. What do you mean? You, you said that? What? Come here. There will come a time, there will come a time, that will only come, we will only be tested when the world knows and when the world sees that we stand up for His sake. And when we don't stand up for His sake, there's no reason for the world to persecute me. There's no reason for the world to, to, to go against me or to accuse me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All those that stand for God will be ridiculed and persecuted. But don't give up. Don't be alarmed. But if the world is not persecuting you and me, then there's reason to be alarmed. You know why? Because we're doing too good a job fitting in with the rest. We're doing too good a job. Now comes the parable. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trembled, trampled under foot. You are the salt of the earth. And as such, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to mourn. You have to be meek. You have to hunger and thirst. You have to be merciful. You have to be pure in heart. You have to be a peacemaker. You have to be persecuted for righteousness sake. And as such, you fit into the world and the world sees these things in you. And in your life and in your love. And the world begins to ask questions about this transformation. And the world begins to change. And then our prayer uh, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven begins to be answered through us. The salt of that time came mostly from the Dead Sea. And as such, that salt had a lot of impurities in it. 
And we're told that this salt, if held on for long periods of time, would in fact lose its saltiness. And after it's lost its saltiness, what does it become? Basically just dirt, just sand. And what good is it? Our lives have to make a difference wherever we are, in our workplace, in our schools, in our neighborhood, in our place of business. Our lives have to make a difference. I was so encouraged last week. Not that somebody came to church through an invitation of a colleague at work, but what they said about the colleague. We had two ladies and one lady with a daughter here last week. Now, it's great to have them and come and worship with us. But during lunch, as I spoke with them, they gave me their opinion of the friend who brought them here in the absence of the friends. So they weren't saying things to make her look good or to praise her in front of her. But it was encouraging to know that the people there were affected by the actions, the attitude, and words of the person with whom they worked. That is being the salt of the earth. When we live those lives, people begin to ask, people want to know, and they want to study the word of God, that they may know the only true God. How God deals with those people or others is up to Him. It's the Spirit of God that convicts people. But in bringing people the message of Jesus Christ, we have to be able to speak it and live it. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Your Father in heaven. heaven. Glorify not you, but glorify who? Because it is His deeds, not mine. Verse 16. In the same way it says, what? Let your light shine. Let it shine. Does it say that first you go ahead and create the light? Is that what it says? It says just don't cover it. Just let it do what it's going to do. The power of God puts that light in your life and mine through His Spirit. And too often, we are ashamed or shy. We don't want to be recognized as a believer. And so we kind of, oh, yeah, yeah, what, 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 what are, are you Hindu? Well, no, I'm a Christian. What, what do you believe? Well, I, uh, we We can, uh, we can win arguments, we can win debates. But winning debates is not what the objective is. It's winning souls. Amen. Winning souls comes down to not only what you say, but how you live and how you treat people. Don't tell me how many debates you've won, tell me how many souls you've brought to the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. By your actions. I judge myself by the same, by the same measure that God wants to judge us. And that we are to do His work. We are the salt of the earth. We will be trampled underfoot if we don't have the saltiness to mix with the world. When God created the world, what did He create first? Light. And what happened? Did the earth do something to create that light on its own? Well, what 
was the role of the earth? What was the great miracle of the earth? And what did it do through its power to make light? Nothing. The Bible tells us God said, let there be light. When we give God ourselves as his domain, it is his words that says, let there be light and our life becomes a source of light that comes from God that we should not, we cannot hide. And so God says, let your light so shine. My desire for myself, with all of my weaknesses, and I know them better than anybody else. God knows them better than me. You, well, your husband knows your weaknesses. Your wife knows them. Your children know them. God knows them. A prayer for myself, is in spite of myself, God would give me the spirit of humility that I may acknowledge my uselessness, my lack of spirituality, my lack of mourning, my lack of hungering and thirsting, my lack of being persecuted, because maybe I fit in too well. My desire for myself is the same as it is for you, all of us, that collectively, together, we grow into God day by day. Amen. That reading and studying His Word, we become what He wants to make us. We need to remember that coming to God through Jesus Christ is not a partial commitment. It is not a changing of who I am. It is a death of who I am. The old man must die and the new man must be born. We cannot sew a new cloth on the old one and hope to repair it. We cannot take new wine and pour it into the new one, old one. We've got to change completely. And the only way that we can do it is the power of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. I pray that all of us soon spend time more and more in prayer not just in study, because studying the Bible is learning what God is telling us. And prayer is our commitment to let God know that we have accepted what He is sending us. We need to not only study, but spend time in prayer. And I will pray for all of you and ask you to pray for me as we work together to do God's work and bring people to the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's all rise for our closing now. 316, live out thy life.